started. Welcome everybody and especially welcome to Emily Dr. Burton. We're thrilled to have you here today. I'll just say a few brief words about Emily's biography. She's uh, currently the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Professor of International Justice and Human Rights. She's also a professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy and professor in the Department of Political Science at uh, UCSD. I, I know you're <coughs> all familiar with Emily's work uh, on human rights and on the topic uh, which we'll talk about today and secrecy and transparency in, in international investment arbitration. I'll just mention that um, Emily is the author of the Princeton University book, the 2013 book, Making Human Rights a Reality, and also an author of the Cornell uh, University Press 2009 book, Forced to be Good, Why Trade Agreements Boost Human Rights. Emily, you're all familiar with her CV, has um, uh, an impressive and vast array of journal articles and peer-reviewed journals and just an extremely impressive uh, uh, history and body of research. With that, let me turn it over to you, Emily. Again, welcome, and uh, we're looking forward to the talk. You can set the ground rules however you'd like in terms what of- What are your own ground rules? rules? Are you interrupters? You're welcome to interrupt me for clarifying questions. If don't, you don't pretend what I'm like to do, or, okay, all right. You can get um, to the end. All right, well, um, I really am uh, genuinely excited to be here, and I really want to thank everyone. I know how complicated it is to organize uh, these types of visits, and so I really appreciate you taking the time out. Um, to meet with me. I also have to be honest that I have complete wanderlust intellectually. Um, so I'm going to present something to you that's a little different today than you might know some of my other work, but I did promise that I was going to make an attempt to tie it back in because it genuinely does tie into my broader research agenda. So um, David and I run a lab on international law and regulation at UCSD, and the general idea behind the lab is to study international institutions and how you get institutions to get the job done in a variety of different contexts. So he works a lot on environment and energy, I've worked a lot on trade and human rights. And um, in the guise of this lab, we started a new set of projects when we came to UCSD about eight years ago, focused on the role of firms in international relations, because we had thought there wasn't enough focus, uh, on, too much focus on states, not enough on firms. And we were particularly interested in thinking about the role of firms in utilizing, shaping, sometimes even attempt, potentially trying to circumvent international institutions. So what I want to talk to you about right now is one very specific component of that broader project, which is focused on international investment arbitration and around the uh, controversy that has arisen uh, around secrecy. So I'd like to just take a few minutes to try and set the context for you here about why I got interested in this, why I think it's interesting genuinely to me and politically, and then we'll dig into some of the details on the actual project. So that's the scoop. So um, there's... Investment arbitrations in the international space have skyrocketed in the last three decades, really two decades. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, a lot of bilateral investment treaties and some regional free trade agreements like NAFTA that include investment chapters now allow companies to take governments directly to an arbitration process for claims of things like expropriation, uh, discrimination, other intentional, wrong, wrongful, harmful actions. And the reason we've created these institutions is precisely to allow governments to try and send credible signals to investors that they're likely to protect investor rights. So this mechanism is supposed to provide the credible signal. All of that is supposed to be good for flows of foreign direct investment. All of that is supposed to be good for the process of development. So these are important institutions. There's a bunch of them that uh, arbitrate internationally, and we're going to focus on one specific one in this project, which is the arm of the World Bank. It's known as ICSIN, the International Center for Settlement Disputes. And we're focusing on it for two reasons. One is, from the best of our guesstimates, and we don't actually know the specific details, I'm breaking your thing here, um, it has the market share of most arbitrations running through these institutions, probably about 60%, we think, around that, um, that level. The other reason, which is the one that I'm quite interested in, is that this institution has been incredibly controversial. And that's not least because if I'm an investor and I take a government to arbitration, Siemens takes Argentina to arbitration, for example, that's public information. You know that's happened. That's where it ends. After that point in time, it is not necessarily the case that you know anything about what bargains were struck, about the process of negotiation inside this institution, or even at the end of the day, who won, who lost, and on what terms. The parties to this process can choose to conceal that information formally from the public. So there's a mechanism of secrecy here. And that, of course, has become politically controversial because it's playing into some very <coughs> long-standing debates about the role and the value of public information in the international space and international negotiations. So why I think this is kind of interesting is because there's some 
well, complicated tensions and trade-offs that are occurring as a result. So on the one hand, you want to think that public information is a good thing. It helps to establish norms. It helps to set expectations. Uh, it might lead to additional uh, accountability. It might lend legitimacy to institutions. It might facilitate greater participation. And all of that, in theory, could be a good thing. But we also know that public information can incentivize parties to posture when parties start drawing red lines in the sand that they can't easily back away from once they've laid down the terms. And that makes it difficult to actually facilitate the execution of these disputes. So it kind of plays both ways. Secrecy is helpful because it can solve your posturing problem, right? It allows you to make sort of inconvenient deals in the back room without outing yourself in the public space. But by doing that, it also undermines the very purpose of these institutions, which is to allow governments to send credible signals. And it's hard to know what the signal is if you don't know who won or who lost in the process. So it's a very interesting and complicated set of, of trade-offs. So um, you can see here that um, this just shows you the lifetime of of all the cases that have rolled through this institution. There are over 600, so this is utilized quite frequently. And the uh, darker bars show you the cases that have been uh, kept secret. So it's about two-fifths. It's not the majority of cases, but 40% is an awful lot of concealment of information on some really big, important issues. So the fundamental question we're trying to tackle in this particular little slice of the project is why? Which, which parties, what are the incentives that would lead parties to try and conceal information from the public? Particularly when this information uh, concealment is pretty politically controversial. It's become a hot button issue. So that's our uh, topic for the next hour. So a quick roadmap of where I'd like us to go. I'm going to give you a super brief overview of the ICSIP process, just as it relates to the decision to conceal information so you have the basics of the institution. Very quickly summarize the arguments, the incentives that we think are potentially driving this process. Talk very briefly about some empirical relationships that we are uncovering in a large group data set that we collected on all arbitrations uh, throughout the process of history. Uh, you will see very uh, shortly that this is very frustrating. Uh, it's very hard to study empirically things that are inherently uh, unobservable. And so there's a lot of frustration uh, involved uh, in this process as well, but I'm uh, looking forward to seeing your thoughts about this. Then I'm going to turn, if we have time, um, to a case of a leak, a single leak that we found that uh, will allow us to say something observable about what should formally uh, be unobservable. And then I'm going to end with a few of the implications that I find particularly interesting about this and do my best to sort of tie it into my broader research agenda. Any questions? That's the roadmap for today. OK, wonderful. So uh, very briefly, let's just talk about ICSID and <coughs> what you need to know. There are four actors that really matter here. The claimants, these are the investors who are accusing host governments uh, nominally to try and get some sort of recompensation uh, for the harm. The respondents are about to be accused. We have the arbitrators. These are essentially the judges. There's three uh, per panel, and they operate by majority vote. So two out of three, and you win or lose a case. And you have the institution of the secretariat itself. And the secretariat is very important. We're going to talk about it in some detail because there's some interesting results um, that we find, puzzling results that we find. This uh, institution oversees the process and manages any sorts of reforms that so this is a stylized illustration of the process. Don't, don't worry if you can't see my teeny tiny text. I'll draw your eyes to the part of the screen I'd like you to see in a moment. But the process starts when uh, a claimant charges a, a government, and they file an exit. They start paying <coughs> fees. They locate their arbitrators and start paying fees to their arbitrators. <coughs> now, what's interesting about this is it's right here in the very beginning of the arbitration process where the decision to conceal information is made. That is to say, before any oral evidence is ever obtained, before any arguments are ever heard, and before it is clear at all who will win or who will lose this case. And what's interesting about this institution is that can be a unilateral decision. Any party to an arbitration can request the concealment of information. So that's the institutional mechanism, the tool by which parties can, can do it. So the question then becomes an interesting one, which is, well, who exactly is utilizing this process, given the fact that it's so politically controversial. Why would you choose to conceal information? So the reason this was created in the first place way back in the day when ICSID was created was to generate the flexibility for parties uh, to solve a variety of different problems. And there are two in particular that I want to focus on for a minute. One is it provides the flexibility to solve this posturing problem. It precisely allows governments and investors to behind the back doors make deals that might be politically inconvenient to put into the public space otherwise, right? 
And this is particularly helpful in certain types of disputes. So disputes where you have long-lived investments at stake, where you're going to have an iterated relationship, an ongoing relationship over time. Oftentimes where you have massive capital sunk into the economies, oftentimes in very central or visible ways. I think power plants, for example, could be one. Where the continued operation of these investments is going to require an ongoing relationship between the parties to dispute. So they're not utilizing arbitration to halt the relationship, which is how we often think about that. They're actually utilizing arbitration to continue the relationship, but to renegotiate the terms of the process. And that is going to happen in these particular types of industries. Governments do not want to be seen capitulating right, to big uh, corporations. That never plays well in the public space. And the shareholders of, public, of corporations don't want to be seen capitulating uh, to governments with arcane regulatory. So secrecy is particularly helpful in disputes over these types of investments in order to solve that problem. So that's our first sort of supposition. There's another realm in which secrecy turns out to be very helpful, and that's with regards to reputation. And that's particularly uh, the case with regards to the government at stake, because governments need the flexibility to hide their wrongdoings in this process so that they don't ultimately undermine the signal to other potential investors that they too will engage in wrongdoing. So secrecy allows them some flexibility to do it. So the assumption that we're making here is that governments are going to become very risk averse in this process over time. They're not going to want to out their losses in the public space. They're going to want to do it uh, behind closed doors. They don't want to boost that signal to other investors that they're unlikely to be friendly to, uh, to investor policies. They want to avoid oftentimes the, the costs of being admonished by an international institution or a foreign company. You see that playing out very, very strongly in Latin America right now. And they may also want to conceal other information because uh, several cases in the past have outed instances of illicit behavior or corruption on both sides. So there's a lot of reasons why governments that are worried about their wrongdoings might want to conceal this information if they think they're going to lose. Everyone wants to win in the public space. You just don't want to lose in the public space. There's also some new interesting research that suggests that governments are acting like narcissistic learners in the context of international agreements. That is, they're not appropriately assessing the risks at the time that they're joining these institutions. It's only once they've been taken into the arbitral process that they recognize, aha, this is a very bad thing to be losing in the public space. And they then update and do their best to stay out of the public space from here on out. So uh, that's another area where we think this flexibility mechanism is really likely to be useful to, to governments. So the way you can make this calculation, it's hard to do because in the area of investment, there's a great deal of uncertainty. Uh, there's no precedent in the formation of international investment law. There's multiple interpretations of a lot of the core treaties. Uh, there's oftentimes contested interpretations. So one way to do this is to look at your past history of losing in, in the past as a proxy for your capacity to defend yourself in the future. So pretty, pretty straightforward. So these are some of the incentives that we think are pushing certain types of parties and certain types of disputes to really want to conceal information from the public. But there's a flip side to this, which um, is interesting, because Ixon created this. It's really not controversial when it, it, the institution created this mechanism. But it became controversial over time. And that was not expected uh, or anticipated at the time that this, this mechanism was put into place. So there are a variety of different pressures that, since really the year 2000, have been pushing uh, against the norm towards uh, secrecy. And I want to talk about a few of them, because um, they're quite interesting. The first is the World Bank, right? Everybody knows that the bank has been the subject of a lot of public scrutiny and a lot of public criticism. Battle of Seattle, uh, you know, you'll remember, charges that the bank needs to be made more transparent, it needs to be made more accessible, more open to the public. And the bank has been responsive uh, in some regards to some of this criticism and has indeed undertaken various reforms to lead to greater accountability and transparency. And ICSID as an arm of the bank has certainly not been immune from the pressures of the bank. The second and related are the civil society organizations that have grown up focused specifically for the first time on investment. Uh, and this happened really sparked by a particular incident in the year 2000 where an ICSID panel ruled in favor of a major US corporation named Metalclad who had charged that the Mexican government's effort to uh, institute an environmental regulation uh, in Mexico was against international law because it was tantamount to expropriation of metal clad, which, by the way, was dumping uh, in that area. 
So you can see the outrage that would occur in the public space when uh, the World Bank tells Mexico they can't regulate their environment because it's inconvenient to a U.S. toxic corporation. This led to a very substantial movement and additional set of pressures on the bank, but on arbitral mechanisms in general uh, to push against uh, the norms of secrecy for more accountability uh, and more transparency. Third, um, and in sort of reaction to all of this, you get a growing number of governments, not that many, but a growing number that are just trying to solve the problem at the source. So they're going and they're renegotiating or negotiating new contracts that simply require disclosure. And I'll come back to that um, in a minute. And then fourth, you have the Secretariat itself that is reacting to all of this, fully understanding that, well, they cannot force parties to disclose information because they will lose their market share. They need to figure out a way to push back against the tendency of these, of these parties to conceal information. So they nominally take some early reforms in the 80s, not really. The big movement happens in 2001, right after Metal Cloud, uh, and then becomes institutionalized in 2006. So there's, yes? There's one quick question. Do both parties have to agree to secrecy or can one force it? One. Right. Unilateral decision. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, unilateral decision. So, um, I'll come back to that one later. So this suggests, uh, in the words of the Secretary General, that they believe that ICSID should be at the forefront of the movement towards uh, an increase in transparency in, in investment arbitration. And so we should expect to see a decline in the concealment of this information, if that's right, over time. Okay, so let me shift to talking about the empirics um, for a little bit. We spent a lot of time uh, with a team of lawyers and a team of economists, uh, and a bunch of graduate students in our lab, coding this massive new data set on all arbitrations before ICSID. And we coded hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, everything we could possibly think of uh, about all the mentions of this case. I want to talk about just the simplest component of it um, today, and that is um, secrecy, simply a binary outcome of did you conceal the information or did you reveal the information? And it's either or, there's kind of nothing in between in this process. So uh, we're gonna look at trying to identify these correlates. Um, we're gonna start by coding the long-lived nature for, uh, we fought a lot over the right way to put this term. This is the iterated investments that we think are really different. And we spent a bunch of time with the team trying to suss that information out about exactly what was the nature of the industry at stake. I'll skip the boy details, but happy to talk about them if you're interested uh, about how we got to that. About 50% of the cases are in these types of industries. There's a lot of variation, and I'll show you more about that in a minute. So then in order to sort of suss out whether or not governments are becoming risk averse over time when they start losing in these institutions, will uh, look for all the time that they have previously publicly lost in a case. And then we'll make sure we're going to differentiate the different zeros in here, which is to say the governments that have never previously publicly lost because they've always won from those that have never previously publicly lost because they've just never been to arbitration in the public space. So those are very different. Uh, and we hear about the former. And then we're going to attempt to try and suss out this um, sort of hypothesis that the exit secretariat is so um, keen on that we should really see reform movements leading to a decline in all of this bad stuff over time. And we're going to just start by doing that by making an assumption that the reform starts in the year 2001 and rolls out cumulatively over time, but it's just an assumption and we'll relax it. Just a clarification question. So a secret arbitration, the decision is released, but no information on Decision is not released. The decision is, decision not, released. is not released. All we know is that I have taken you to court. Sometimes an excerpt of the legal reasoning will be released, but you cannot correlate the excerpt of the legal reasoning to the outcome of the case. So literally, you don't know who won the <coughs> lost. You don't know on what grounds. So you could possibly observe changes in the party's behavior later and infer something, or is it? In some cases? Well, so that's an extension of the project. Uh -huh. And so one of the things I'm working on um, now, can we come back to that? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm actually here because I would like suggestions, because I have an idea for a series of extensions about how you would plausibly get at this little bit from there. But it's, a, it's part of the reason why this has been in a drawer for a while, and <laughs> why I wanted to dust it off and see if you have ideas, because it's frustrating to try and study this degree of secrecy. OK, so that's how we're going to come. Did you have a question? OK, account for the forum. Then we need to just um, account for a couple of other institutional things. These are a bit in the weeds, so I'll be quick about them. 
One is, as I mentioned, that some governments are just trying to solve this problem at the source. So they're just creating bits that don't allow secrecy. So you just want to suck that out because there's no choice being made here whatsoever. Um, that would ridiculously onerous to actually figure out because we have to go and do content analysis of every treaty and every arbitration in order to determine whether or not you were allowed to disclose information or not. Um, so we didn't think I should do that. There's one additional um, institutional explanation here that might be affecting this process, uh, this decision to conceal information. And that is both parties um, to a dispute need to be members of the ICSID convention in order for that stylized graph I showed you to lay out. When they're not, when one or more of them is not, it goes through a different procedure inside ICSID. And to make a long story short, it's called the additional facility. And it oftentimes requires additional scrutiny and enforcement through the domestic legal system. And that means information is often outed through that process. So even if they attempt to conceal information, they may not be able to do so. So that's just something we need to pay attention to. And then we spend an awful lot of time thinking about every other possible thing that might be influencing this decision to conceal information on both sides of this coin. And so we looked at things like domestic political institutions, uh, bribery conventions, dependency on foreign direct investment, inflation <coughs> rates, you name it, uh, corruption levels. Uh, we, we tried to take um, that into account. So, yes? Is, so are these, is this going to include uh, features that you've coded from the arbitration about the, or are these features of just a? These are features of the claimant and the respondent. Okay, and of the specific, specifically arbitration. Correct. Okay. Like what is it about and what is the... So, we, so this is where the frustration comes because what I can tell you is whether or not the case was secret or not. Unless the case was public, I cannot tell you what the dispute was about. But you see, you're going to see things in here like what industry are we in? Correct. What is the like, broad topic? Exactly. Exactly. But even from there, it's very hard to infer oftentimes because you're looking at multinational corporations that dabble in so many things. It would be hard for me to nail down precisely what, what element of it. <coughs> These are dyadic analyses, right? There are two parties and... No, we're looking at uh, this particular, well, we've looked at it in many different ways. The data we're looking at, I'm talking about right now, is the um, uh, case year. But is the counterfactual going to be the same case, one party is different, same case, both parties are different? What's the counterfactual? Um, so the counterfactual, and so the, the, that same case, wait, no, say again? Same case, both parties are different. Well, think about metal plan, for example. Yeah. It's a counterfactual. Metal plan is an investor from a different country, but still in Mexico. That investor is investing in a metal plan investment, but in Guatemala instead of Mexico. What's so, so, okay, so it's just a different case entirely. What, what's the population? It's a different. Entirely? It's a different case entirely. So the investors in this. So respondents repeat players in these games. There are only one inve investors are generally one shot off. So investors don't take multiple companies, countries to arbitration uh, over time in this. So countries are, are, the, are the subject of arbitration, though sometimes multiple times. So each of these, uh, we're treating them as if they're apples and apples. Does that make sense? OK, so long list of things um, that we're trying to suck out the variation for. OK. so. Um, what uh, we end up finding is that there is, and I'm just going to show you some graphical illustrations of what the team put together um, for these much more complicated series of results, that there does seem to be some relationship between the nature of the dispute involved and the probability that you're going to engage in secret arbitration. This is just showing you the number of disputes in a particular type of industry that has gone to arbitration that these are the longer-lived investments as the team coded, uh, and this shows you the probability of engaging in secret arbitration. And there is a greater probability to some extent of engaging in secrecy of concealing information if you're operating in the word world of roads and rail, mining, and hydrocarbons. So there's some relationship there. More interesting, um, I find, is there seems to be a pretty strong relationship between risk aversion over time. So this is showing, showing you the number of past cases a respondent has lost uh, over the probability of secret arbitration. And if you haven't lost before, you basically never conceal information. There's not really any good reason to do it, and you're very rarely going to do that. But as soon as you start racking up a loss or two, you become much more risk averse over time, uh, and you're going to conceal information. <coughs> Theoretically, this could be the exact same for the claimants as well. It's just that claimants are not repeat players in this game. So they're usually um, one shot. So there does seem to be a very strong relationship between losing and wanting to conceal information.
So I want to say something about um, the reform part of this now, because I have some <coughs> ideas about some of the incentives that are potentially pushing towards the concealment of information. But we did not find what we expected to find, nor what the ICSID Secretariat is claiming about the reform. Uh, and this was a source of great frustration, um, because we could not find a decline in secrecy over time. Uh, we found instead the opposite, which was a correlation to an increase in secrecy over time. Uh, and that's really not what we expected to find. So I want to say a few things uh, about this, and it's something that we're still really puzzling um, over. Of course, it's hard to know what the counterfactual is here. Um, the first is that um, this could be an artifact of our coding decision to code reform in the year 2001 sort of roll it forward cumulatively. That might be the wrong way to think about it. So the team tried to think about it in a whole lot of different ways. Um, and one of them was to just make the assumption that you can call the reform treatment any, any old year you want, and we'll start it back in 1986 when the first nominal reforms come, and simply roll it forward year by year all the way through the 2006 reform. Um, and we really can't get that negative correlation to go away. We sort of sucked it out in every possible iteration that the team could think of, and despite their greatest efforts, I could not get, they could not get that to go away. So there is something happening that over time, uh, we are not seeing the decline that it's claiming we're seeing or that we would hope to be seeing. So that's not happening. Um, the second thing that uh, I want to say about this is that we can absolutely make no causal claims about any of this. Uh, certainly you cannot do that with these data. Um, so it's possible, maybe, that somehow the imposition of these reforms backfired by generating new incentives for parties to engage in secrecy. Uh, it's also uh, plausible that there are other incentives that ICSID was simply responding in its reform movement to other forces that were driving parties to conceal information that we just haven't appropriately accounted for. That's possible. Uh, we really spent months and months and months sort of delving through this one and we really couldn't, couldn't really figure out what to make of it. So I'm still puzzling over it. If you have ideas, um, I'd love to hear them. One possible explanation, I suppose, could be growing competition from other venues. So it's not the only institution that allows arbitration. There are a myriad of other venues. And it's possible that maybe ICSID, in response to all the hubbub and push for reform, has instituted a sort of growing set of guidelines that it just can't or doesn't even really want to push on the parties because they can simply forum shop to go elsewhere. So maybe forum shopping has led this to be cheap talk. I'll be curious to see if you have thoughts about how to think about that. Um, I think what I would like to do now is talk a little bit about the mechanisms that are here, because there's another interesting set of stories here, which is that there's two ways that you can engage in secrecy in this institution. And the first is to run it through the entire process, and then you determined already you're not going to publish that information. But the other is you can set part way through this process, through a discontinuance or a formal type of settlement. Um, we have a, I think it's forthcoming, or maybe it's just out, article in the Yale Journal of International Law, specifically on settlement, uh, that talks about it in great detail, and I'm happy to chat more if you're interested in settlements. Right now, I just want to tell you something that I found that's interesting in this process, which is that we learned that these risk-averse governments who are, are engaging in secrecy after they're losing, they're much more likely to do it through the mechanism of settlement than they are through the mechanism of running the process rather than simply concealing the formal information at the end. And I think that's very interesting, theoretically, because it tells us that governments that are sensitive are utilizing these institutions to make deals under the shadow of the law. And again, that's not generally how we've thought about the purpose of the arbitration process. So it looks a little different. That's interesting. We learn nothing about sort of variation by industry. It doesn't really seem to matter. Uh, if you're in a high, longer-lived industry, you're more likely to conceal information, but you're not more likely to engage in settlement uh, versus the other mechanism to do it. So that we did, did not gain much traction. OK. So I'd like to talk about this case that we found, because we spent a lot of frustration trying to figure out how to think about uh, these uh, cases empirically when we had no ability to actually look at the details of any concealed case. And so we found a case that was leaked. Uh, there was only one that we were able to find, find, and we found it quite late into the project. So I think it's worth talking through some of the details of it because it's quite interesting and it gives us a chance to sort of observe whether or not any of this broader sort of theory makes sense in this particular 
So I'll say a few words about this, and then for the sake of time, since I know many of you have to leave, I'll just tell you some of the implications that I find interesting and uh, tie it to my research agenda. So this case concerns Chevron's national gas production in Bangladesh. And it sparked in the mid-1990s with the uptick of growth in India and the search by many different corporations to try and figure out ways to pipe fuel and electricity into the Indian economy. And Unical, uh, who is now Chevron, but at the time was Unical, US-based company that specializes in the production of natural, natural gas in so Unical uh, looked at a bunch of different ways that they might be able to get into the Indian market. And one of those was to purchase gas in Bangladesh. That's why you're looking at a map of Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh and to pipe it into the Indian economy. So it bought several major blocks, it explored, it found gas, uh, and then it put together a contract with Petro Bangla, that's Bangladesh's state-owned hydrocarbon monopoly, to transit the gas into India. At that same time, it also incorporated its investments into a series of Bermuda companies that would give it access to arbitration if it needed it under the UK Bangladeshi bid down the road. So it was covering its, its assets. Now, political relations, of course, sour between Bangladesh and India, and it's no longer an option for, uh, for the company to pipe the gas into India because Bangladesh simply refuses to do so. So Chevron is now in a pickle uh, because it has invested billions of dollars in uh, this industry and, and it can't transit the gas. So it has no choice at this point but to uh, sell the gas back to Petro Bangla to then redistribute within the Bangladeshi economy. And Petro Bangla charges Chevron a 4% transit fee to do this and that's hundreds of millions of dollars. So Chevron contends that the transit fee was never meant if Bangladesh was going to redistribute the gas to itself, it was meant to pipe the gas into India, and so it takes uh, Bangladesh to arbitration at Ixim. So at that time, not only had, uh, Petro, had Chevron invested billions of dollars, but it is also the case that it was the number one client of Petro Bangladesh. So it was a very mutually dependent relationship that these two players uh, were having. The dispute was interesting uh, for us because it does sort of fit all the basic characteristics that you would expect to see. So this is the oil and gas industry. If you want to talk about a long-lived, iterated investment relationship, this is certainly it. Uh, it's certainly also a very politically controversial relationship. And it was clear that these two parties to dispute had no intention of using arbitration to end dispute. In fact, during the middle of the arbitration process, uh, Petro Bagot would give Chevron the thumbs up to invest millions and millions of dollars in a new gas compressor uh, and new gas exploration is happening during the process of arbitration. So this is clearly a long-lived, iterated relationship. And Bangladesh had lost at Ixid three years early, uh, earlier at the hands of a British company, so they had uh, just suffered this sort of loss. So on both sides, every incentive should have been to conceal information. Formally, the case is still to this day concealed, but we know the results because it was leaked uh, several years later uh, into some Indian trade magazines uh, in, the, in the industry. We don't know why it was leaked. We don't know who leaked it. Uh, what we do know is that, shockingly, Bangladesh won this case, uh, which was certainly not the expectation, uh, and that the president of Bangladesh, uh, former president of Bangladesh, was one of the arbitrators in the case. So, uh, <laughs> very interesting. Okay, so a couple of the implications that I find interesting about this project as it sort of relates to my interests. There's a scholarship on arbitration and on bits has completely taken off in the last decade that's led to some really interesting sort of political debates about the purpose um, politically but also normatively of these institutions. So you have sort of scholars and practitioners on one side of this debate arguing that bits uh, in this process are fair, efficient mechanisms to spread property rights, um, to spread foreign direct investment, to developing economies, uh, and that all this is going to be good for economic development um, and sustainable economic development. But you have others arguing that these types of institutions are a source of exploitation of the developing world <coughs> by super wealthy corporations. Uh, doing it in ways that are completely inconsistent with standard democratic practice because they are um, being uh, hidden. Right? And for both sides of this debate, the elective role of secrecy 
turns out to be really important because in the first, it's the thing that provides you the efficient solution. And in the second, it's the thing that's fundamentally violating the norms of international justice. Um, so it's interesting, and it's never been studied before. So a couple of implications um, that I find interesting about this. First is, again, I've mentioned it before, but this notion that, that people or governments and investors are using these institutions to actually bargain with the shadow of the law, oftentimes not to end the relationship, but to change the terms of the relationship, and doing so over very consequential uh, investments. But that, and precisely for that very same reason, we are often least informed in these cases that have very substantial implications for things we might care about, like health policy, environmental policy, human rights policy, social policy, all of which have been implicated in some of these cases. Things where governments traditionally ought to have the regulatory space, right? Not national corpor international corporations to be determining in, in Mexico's environmental policy, right? So there are big implications to, uh, to this, this process and the concealment of information. Um, this is really important because it is uh, precisely for this reason that we see a very substantial backlash against this institution and against the regime at this point. And the backlash isn't just a handful of angry NGOs, it's governments, uh, powerful, important governments in the developing world that are pulling out of these institutions or threatening to pull out of these institutions. And that has huge implications for the health of the investment regime and for the process of development and flow of investments across borders. So this is really important, um, an important issue. Another implication that I find interesting because it uh, relates to a lot of the work that I've previously done in the area of human rights is that if the lawyers and the scholars are right that secrecy is a bad thing, and as you can tell, I think it's a debate, a genuine debate, I don't think it's quite that easy, uh, but if they're right, uh, they don't seem to be right on what the right policy is to actually stop out the problem. Uh, and that raises an interesting set of questions about exactly what do you do then if all these myriad of reforms uh, that have been put into place are not leading to a concrete decline, what, what can be done? And I have some thoughts about that um, if we have the opportunity to chat. The last one is, um, I suppose, a methodological point, but I think really a substantive which is that these sh should help scholars leverage some other important questions, which is who exactly is winning and losing from this system of international investment laws? And is it actually the case that the developing world is being discriminated against inside these institutions or not? Uh, and that's been hard. There's been scholars that have attempted to look at this. It's been hard to do, though, when you have a non-random distribution of the information that's being publicized and not publicized. So this provides a little bit of additional information that will allow, um, if not me, others to say something uh, about this notion of discrimination. And I think that's a really important uh, and, and pressing question. Okay, so um, this is somewhat very different from some of the other work that I do, but really my overarching research agenda in my career has been the study of international institutions and social justice. And I actually see a conversation about secrecy very much as a conversation that involves social justice, in no small part because the very notion of having information concealed is a matter of justice, but also that some of the cases that are rolling through these institutions directly implicate human rights policy, environmental policy, social policy, and health policy, areas where we ought to have access to information. In the past, uh, I've spent a lot of my work doing um, an uh, analysis of trade institutions and their relationship to the provision of human rights, uh, the spread of human rights norms and laws. Um, that uh, is evolving a little bit. Uh, this is my current research agenda underneath this guise is focusing on election violence right now. I'm doing a big project on election violence in the developing world uh, with some colleagues. I have a new project on international organizations and the diffusion of corruption, uh, which I view very much as a question of social justice. I've got some interesting firm-level work on lobbying and international human rights policy, so we can get the implications of uh, not the effects of NGOs who are trying to lobby these policies, which is the way we generally study uh, this process, but the effect of corporate actors who, in fact, put most of the money into the system of lobbying on human rights. Um, still working on U.S. trade policy and human rights, and I have a new project on China and international lending institutions. So you can see my wanderlust. Uh, I promised I would try to sort of put it together in a broader package for you.
Um, but I do believe uh, this issue of secrecy is really fundamentally an important one uh, and does implicate important issues of social justice. So thank you for your unbelievably attentive, uh, quiet attention to detail. So I'd be thrilled to hear any thoughts, questions. I have this um, huge data set, which as I mentioned, I got really frustrated with. And my, uh, my team of uh, economists and I stuck it in a drawer <laughs> for a while. And I'm kind of trying to decide whether we should dust it off and pull out some, some new questions of that. And I haven't decided yet. So if you have suggestions or questions that you think interesting, I would be delighted to hear what you think. Great. Thank you. Open it up to questions. I'll take a bunch of that mark. Uh, so just three reflections on the talk, thanks very much, I uh, also find it very interesting. Um, when you talk about the time duration of investment, long term investment, do you actually just mean asset specificity or do you mean something different from that? So um, it is, uh, we can't differentiate, so yes, we mean asset specificity, but we cannot differentiate that, this is the problem in um, the sort of discussion, we cannot differentiate that from the cases themselves. Because while we know the industry, we, it, we don't, you don't know the specific case, right? No, and the right. problem, yeah, this is one of the main frustrations of this, right? So, and so we can't, we can't interpolate that information. We can do it by and large for certain types of industries that are clearly more assets. Hence why the ones on the left yes. hand side. Yes, yes. I was thinking maybe, I mean, it would be a huge amount. One, one of the things you could do is, if you know who the company involved is at least, right? Yes. Then you could basically look at their portfolio of assets and figure out how much of their assets tend to be specific Five assets. Yes. And then you could estimate out of that. That's a good suggestion. So that could be one. Um, second one, the spike after 2001. Uh, I do remember the, the whole scandal over the Canadians leaking the multilateral agreement on investment. Yeah. So maybe there's an incentive at that point, which is a perverse one, which you hint at, which is, oh my goodness, this is suddenly out in the open for the first time. People are really enraged about this. So we should, of course, you know, be more transparent. No, absolutely not. We should actually be even more secret because if we're more transparent, we're just going to get pulled into this maelstrom. And then that becomes a kind of, a, if you will, a path dependency in the way that it gets done. So despite the attempts of the, co the commission, you end up with more secrecy rather than less. It could just be that exogenous factor that did it because it does fit with the timing, yeah. but it could just be coincidence. Okay. And then the last thought was, um, is there any way of checking out whether governments that have weak legal representation uh, play into this? Because I imagine when the US is getting sued, they've got a pretty good legal brief, but maybe Bolivia doesn't. So is there any way that you could perhaps estimate that? So um, that's a great question. So we attempted, uh, and one of many of the failed attempts, we attempted to code the legal teams of all cases. Uh, and we were ultimately unable to do so, and so ended up proxying things by BP or something like that, right? With the notion that if you've got your pay street, if you've got the money, you'll, you'll have your pay street advisors. So we could never, we could never get a direct measure of legal uh, resources that were put in by the case. We also attempted to code the legal quality of the case because that's another thing that you would think would really matter here. Of course, we can't do that for half of the right. observations. Uh, and we actually ran into serious trouble trying to figure out a way through that ex ante, even the observable ones. Right. So we thought a lot about those questions, and we had no good answers to them empirically that we were able to. to There's got to be a handful of firms that do this. So, can you generalize from the set of observable cases to the likelihood of the firms representing in the unobservable cases? Maybe. The thing is that there are very few. Players here, so it's actually much more than a handful of firms. The right. is the governments. There's, there's a handful of governments that are being sued over and over and over. They were a couple of handful of governments right. that are in court. That would have been a handful of legal firms that take on the briefs. So, but that we, uh, well, no. no. Inside the United States, yes, but I mean, no, and so. I was thinking like Hogan Levels in Latin America or some like one of the big players that do a lot of this stuff. Yes. Maybe I don't know. Just yes. Like I would have to think about it. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know how to get that information for Bangladesh. Yeah, no, no. But um, anyway, yeah. just some thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Very much enjoyed this. I have um, one clarification question, um, and then uh, an empirical question. So, if you've got your claimants and your respondents and your arbitrators, claimants you say are investors. Is that the same as the firm? Yes, it's okay. the firm. Um, so I was thinking here about the uh, secrecy in, in FDA uh, pharmaceutical regulation. And there the FDA has a choice of whether or not to take uh, a review public 
or not. And it has some of the same kind of calculations about reputational impact. But there, even if it thinks it might lose the what the advisory committee says on the drug, there can be um, other venues in which it might win later on. And so one of my questions to you is, can you look at uh, other venues after arbitration? Is part of the calculation on the part of the respondent, am I gonna lose in this case or not? Or does by going public open up other venues? So what we found in the FDA case is that when it felt like it was in a weak position relative to the firm, it could use the public venue to expose the firm, and so then other venues could then act on the firm above and beyond. It's in part to Mark's question about the capacity of the government too. Um, yes, I might lose, and I will suffer the reputation hit, but in the course of going public, I'll expose this entity that I can't otherwise expose, and then these other venues can step in with stronger muscle than I may have. So, Does that work here? Yes, so it, it's just a minority of cases. So you, you see this very publicly happening in Latin America, for example. Argentina wants to lose, and they want to lose in a public space because that's how they're that because it's going to play to their vote base. Mm -hmm. But they're, there's, it's, they're a very specific outlier in this particular environment because they've been taking arbitration over and over and over again yeah. for a variety of different reasons. Um, so, but in many cases, there are not, form shopping is not always a possible. So the basis of why this would go through the ICSID versus any other institution will be determined as a matter of the treaty. And the treaty, it is a high degree of variation as to where you can actually take your place and play it out. So it's highly dependent on a particular investor and a particular host government who's being accused as to whether or not forum shopping is a possibility or not. And ex ante, we were not able to calculate that. Yeah, yeah. But the answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> so it just it just out. might offer another way of getting some empirical yes. leverage on if there are multiple venues yes. that could be a possibility further down the road. Um, it can help it unpack the logic of secrecy a bit. I wonder if you could say a little bit more too about you know the logic of secrecy on part of the respondents and the logic of the secrecy on part on the part of the investors. Again, with my FDA case in mind, I think of proprietary interests, right? So it's not just flexibility, but I don't have a public as a firm because some retired proprietary is going to get exposed in the process. Um, are there ways in which the benefits and, and costs of going public differ on the part of respondents and um, claim, uh, claimants in your case? Um, I mean. The claimants potentially have a lot less to lose <laughs> than respondents. In terms of going public, it depends a bit on what, on what the fallout of the shareholders are. So one of the next things I'm thinking about doing, and tell me if you think it's interesting or not, is to try and get a, uh, so one of the questions I think is interesting here that you can't empirically say anything about when I'm puzzling through is who exactly are the audiences that you're sending right. these signals to? Right. Because governments are trying to shield themselves oftentimes from voters uh, who or will be upset uh, about the consequences of capitulating the big bad oil companies. That's not going to generally play very well. But claimants have a very different set of uh, people that they need to be worried about. And those might be consumers, depending upon what industry that is, but that might be your shareholders as well. Um, and so the domestic politics and the, and the uh, respondents should also look very different in different directions. The politics inside Argentina don't look anything like the politics inside Russia, don't look anything like the politics inside the United States. So it's very different groups that are being played to with regards to these signals. So one of the things I was thinking about doing was could I look at, for example, if you are um, concealing information in case, does that affect um, like local markets? For example, um, and that would that would let help understand whether the signals are being sent to other companies, right, or whether the signals are being sent to voters. It'd be harder to look at voting in any sort of really comparative way. Um, obviously, but elections would be another possibility. Um, so I don't have a good nail down answer to that question yet, but I think there's some potentially empirically interesting ways to, to suss out who actually is leading these signals um, at the end of the day. Great. And Nick and then Emily, Andrew, Rich, and Wendy. Oh, hi. Okay. Maybe I'll aggregate your question. Not sure. We can okay. take a couple of minutes. Thanks very much. Uh, I thought this was extremely interesting. I wondered um, which debates in the literature you uh, want to address uh, most of all. As I hear um, the research, um, 
as a comparativist, I can see um, the two perspectives which you've summarized slightly differently on secrecy. One is, I guess, a modified Washington consensus view that you need institutions for uh, long-term capital accumulation in the developing world. It's got to be, I don't know if it has to be transparent. That's one of the interesting questions. But the commitment has to be credible. The investor has to know that they're not going to be expropriated, so forth and so on. So that's one perspective. Um, the other one is that this is a form of regulatory capture uh, or uh, nefarious capitalist uh, development of one kind or another. So um, is that the kind of debate that you want to address, or are there also systemic issues, norms versus the nature of power in the international system, or does it really have to do with justice? What if there were um, a framing chapter to this research and the rest of it, which we haven't done, so I don't know how you write the framing chapter, but do you think it would be um, rooted in questions of literature on justice, what justice is, distributive justice, or is it going to be about norms and the nature of the international system, or is it going to be that the people I read that, you know, capitalism is the all-embracing category and we just have to figure out what capitalists are doing? That's a great question. Uh, it's not the latter, uh, but I don't see that the, the former two is mutually exclusive. I see those things as interest completely interlinked. Um, and I, I do very much see these issues as related to norms, and, norms versus interests and the diffusion of justice through these international I actually don't have a very strong uh, view on, on the first take, but I do have a very strong sense of opinion on the latter. So part of what this project speaks to is a whole group of international legal scholars and people working inside these institutions that are genuinely trying to understand how to stop up the concealment of information. And so the whole next phase of this project uh, is directed at the legal audience and at the reform audience, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's laying down a series, helping them walk through a series of proposals inside these institutions, given the political realities of the day, about what we might do to actually dampen this tendency. Uh -huh. And so that's where I'm actually, that's where I have been focused right now since I got frustrated with the data and put it all away. Um, so I'm now talking to the lawyers and to the people inside Nixon about helping them try and figure out what we do about this. If you think it's a problem, what do we do about it? That makes sense. I'm only smiling because if you think of the lawyers who do this, who make a lot of money as capitalists, and are also addressing the earlier debate too. Right. So in the picture, uh, so uh, in the picture where you're relating previous losses to the probability of secrecy. Yes. So your interpretation of that is that it's about risk aversion. So I think one question is just you know, like labeling that as risk. I mean, risk aversion is a particular set of things about risk attitudes. Another way to label that would be like expectations. Like if I lost a lot before, I expect to lose, and I think. That, I'm not sure why we would call it risk aversion rather than expectation. I think the other question I had was what like what that graph looks like if instead of number of losses you have number of cases, because it, you're sort of I think it could easily be the case that I have many cases and the kind of places that have a lot of cases are also places that so I think in some sense the relationship you want to look at is like something like the share of times you have lost mm -hmm. uh, in terms of your secrecy. I think that's going to be closer to the picture you want to do that. Yes, uh, fair enough on the risk aversion expectation. Um, that's, yeah, good point. Um, so, um, yes, uh, I, we have looked at it um, that way. The majority of states have only ever been taken to arbitration once. There are big outliers like Argentina that have literally been in arbitration 10 times. Um, so, when you remove those big outliers, uh, you'll, you will see that most of these um, states have previously lost one or two times. There are a few cases. Like each of us previously publicly lost five times, um, but they are outliers, absolutely, to, to the case. So, yes, I, I should, I will do that. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks. Andrew. Yeah, could you go back to the implications slide? Yeah. Previous one. Um, I mean, all of these implications strike me as plausible, maybe even convincing, um, but I don't see how they flow out of the data analysis. I mean, you stop in the middle of the data analysis and you say, I'm not making any causal claims, the identification problems are too vexing. Yeah. But you know, up here you've got verbs like prevents. When I say X prevents Y, generally the implication is no X, yes, Y. Or you've got nouns like effects, which are generally effects and causes. So I don't understand, I can't square the disclaimer in the middle of the talk that this isn't about causality with the implications. 
Well, we absolutely up front can't make direct causal, we just can't make causal claims with these data. So do these flow out of the data analysis? They are implicit implications out of the data analysis if there is any plausible relationships between the, the processes that we see, which we, we cannot we cannot nail down from what implications plus. We, we can't do it. Um, so these are potential implications from um, from that analysis. Two is just true, right? So secrecy is secret doesn't pull out of the data. Yeah. Right. Just, right. So yes, yeah. Right. Great. Uh, Rick. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Um, one of the things you said, and I interrupted a little later, sorry, um, that I stuck in my mind was that it's hard to study decision making inside international institutions because the information that's available is not randomly distributed. The information available externally is not randomly distributed. So, how do we study institutions then, um, international or otherwise, uh, given that uh, that dilemma? And then, secondly, more internal to your talk, what does that say about your use of the case of Chevron and Bangladesh? Um, maybe what's a little more background about that? Obviously, uh, that's non random information. Great question. So I think the first is that it, um, it's a pretty good explanation for why we study the low-hanging fruit in a lot of what we do in the study of international institutions. We go and we study things for which we have the full population of information that can be coded, and sometimes those things are quite boring. Uh, sometimes those things are not the areas that need to be studied that are the hardest to actually do. I would think, after this experience of working on this project for five years, that I now know why nobody has studied this process this way, because it's been so incredibly difficult to do it. In my previous work, I've been guilty of the, the former, which is to study exactly those types of instances where everything is observable um, in a particular institution. So I think, to answer your question, it simply led to a bias in what we focus on in terms of understanding how international institutions actually function. That's part of what we were hoping to um, pull out of this project. Part of what we also put it in the drawer got frustrated uh, with it after a particular period of, of time. Um, the case of Bangladesh, just absolutely nothing random about any of what's happening here. That case leaked. We don't know why, but my supposition is that it may have leaked because it was so completely astoundingly not what any anybody would have expected in this particular case. So there are clearly nothing random about that case. It's the only piece of information that we were able to find that would give us some indication about what was happening in these casinos. So uh, we can't draw any general lines of conclusions from that other than to say that it fit pretty nicely with the expectations that we had as anti. Uh, would it look different or a different case? Very potentially. Very potentially. Wait, Wendy. Yeah, and then Nina. Nina, you want to continue around this one, Nina? No, it's not. Sorry. So I'm also going to pull um, the Scarbeck game too. I, I, so I'm an Americanist, and so I, I don't have any substantive familiarity with any of this. But I just think of endogeneity in terms of when you enter into, into an international um, institution or international structure. I know a lot more about the WTO and about GATT, and that's what they went domestic side. But so if you go in and you know that there is a veto player in terms of secrecy or not secrecy, that if somebody demands secrecy. It's so automatic, right? And then you 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 spend a fair amount of time on people who lose, and they want to be they, they lose once they want to be secret the next time they come up. But then I think what's endogenous to their losing in the first place, and then why would you why would you enter into an institution that puts you in a situation where there are government that wants to out a corporation or a corporation that wants to out a government where you can't do that if one of the parties says I want it to be secret. So. To me, maybe it's just I need a little more information about the origin of the international institution itself, but it, it seems as though there's some issues of endogeneity with the initial decision to join under that rubric, and then the subsequent I want to proceed once I lose, and I think, well, you're losing for a reason, and maybe that's the thing that we should be thinking about. Um, I think that's right. So uh, part of the, um, so this institution's been around for a very long time, and the mechanism of secrecy is there from the very beginning. And it was simply politically uncontroversial. It was a norm in all arbitration, no matter what institution you were in, that information could be concealed. So it wasn't until these cases started regulating issues that were hot button issues, like health policy and environmental policy, that anyone else started noticing or caring about this. By that time, governments had already belonged to all these institutions. 
right? This institution already formed. So the decision to join these institutions was made long before really any of these players were thinking about, ah, is it going to become politically controversial or problematic to conceal information? Um, so I think the more, the more interesting question for me at this stage is, given that that is now the case, and this is a hot button issue, uh, you do see governments pulling out of these institutions. And my question is, why don't you see more governments pulling out of these institutions precisely for that reason? Uh, I mean, I think the answer is you, there's no better alternative way to send a credible signal to investors uh, around investment. Um, so I mean, there's a, a substantial trade off there. But I also think it, it, the interesting research, I just skimmed it, it, it's not my research, but on these narcissistic learners, right? This very clear notion that governments are oftentimes signing on to these things without clearly understanding the risks at stake until after they've been drawn through the legal process win or lose uh, through the legal process of understanding, uh, OK, wait a minute, I should be a little more careful about this process. Um, but yes, there's complicated issues um, behind it. And then the second question is about um, sort of impact of losing. So what what are, are the characteristics of uh, claimants or respondents who lose um, that we think about uh, that would then um, think, OK, they're going into this, they're probably going to lose, and then they want secrecy. But that relationship, I thought, was really interesting, but I didn't, couldn't figure out where it starts and where it ends um, in terms of sort of explanatory power. Awesome. So one of the things that we did in this uh, process, which was very complicated, was try and match up all the claimant level and arbitration level to firm level data um, for firms that were public, for, for which that information was publicly available, uh, precisely to try and get at this question on the claimant side of things. Uh, we quickly became frustrated because that was impossible to, that was very easy to do in the Americas, it was impossible to do in Russia, it was impossible to do, it was all non-random <laughs> in the impossibilities. So we were not able to, we were not able to say too much more about the claimant level other than at the industry level, um, because the data problems are so complex. Uh, at the governmental level, we have all that information, so we can look very carefully, very carefully um, at, um, you know, are you democratic, are you corrupt, are you free speech, blah, 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 and we have all that information. So that's sort of the next stage of this process to get a better sense of, um, of what that would look like. But that we're really sense. stuck on the thing inside. We have hit the dead end and another, another source of frustration. The data just aren't right there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nina. Yes, um, on this um, sort of secrecy issue in council claims, you've also worked a lot on trade agreements, um, which also involve a lot of secrecy. And you know, the TPP, for example, came in, Obama came in for huge criticism for the secrecy involved there. I mean, how do you see the similarities and differences? I mean, that might, sort of looking at how secrecy works in, in related kinds of negotiations, uh, you know, might support some of the, the arguments here, but how do you see the similarities and differences between the operation of secrecy here and in trade negotiations? That's a great um, question. I hadn't really thought about it. I, I, thinking of, I had thought a lot about the notion of flexibility is very, is very similar in this context. Right? So I mean, that's what escape clauses are for in the, in the realm of trade, to generate precisely the same nature of flexibility, only escape clauses are inherently public uh, mechanisms. Um, so, um, so I'll have to think through a little bit um, more of, of that um, process. We did do a whole lot of empirical research um, separate from this, just focused exclusively on NAFTA and trying to understand the dynamics between the three parties and utilizing uh, secrecy mechanisms to the investment chapter, obviously. Um, and um, there, we find that there are some pretty substantial differences in the way that this process plays out through the NAFTA process than the way it plays out through some of the other FIPS process. Um, and that's um, precisely to the Canadian point where everything is kept a secret, despite all the efforts to actually institute reforms after metal plant ran through NAFTA. So that's part of why it was policy and NAFTA NAFTA stuff. You see the total backfiring of that happening. Trade, where trade negotiations have become more and more and more secret over yeah, time, mm -hmm. precisely yeah. for that reason. Um, whereas that we would have expected. Whereas here we generally, gen genuinely didn't expect to find an increase in secrecy at the time. We genuinely expected to find the opposite thing. So that we're finally moving in the same direction is interesting. Mm -hmm. I think. It might provide some support. I think so. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, so. so I'm not a political scientist, so I'd like the um, clueless question for the end. Um, but uh, so one of the things that struck me was the profound asymmetry of this structure where um, you know you, you only anyone can veto 
release of information, but nobody can demand release of information. And presumably also, you can't know which of the parties asked for secrecy. Right. And so what, what, that, um, what that raises for me is, why are any of these transparent at all? I mean, I'd, my expectation would have been that secrecy was the norm rather than the exception, but it seems that even with the increase, you're still saying, you know, it's less than half. So I think that's a very interesting question. I think, I mean, I think it just comes down to, for most parties in dispute, these things aren't that costly, right? Many of these disputes, the nature of you expropriate my McDonald's, I, I arbitrate, our relationship's done, nobody cares one way or the other, the public's not gonna be voting on these issues, we're not gonna be invested in an ongoing relationship because we've had it, uh, and so there's very little cost to actually consuming the information, um, uh, I'm sorry, to, to uh, publicize the information. Whereas increasingly there are, I mean, genuine costs to, to conceal this information. So I think most of these cases just frankly aren't that controversial. So this raises another question for us, which we have great frustration, because that leads to the uh, hypothesis that, well, then this should be about public controversy. This should be about how, how much of a muck is the case going to make in the public space when it goes public. And that is also something we cannot code, because the cases that are private, we have no way of knowing how controversial they are. And those do not map on the industries as easily as you think they might do so. Again, because of Mark's question, we can't identify the part of the asset is the problem. But my deep supposition is that these cases that are politically controversial, absolutely those are the cases where you're going to hide that information. And that most of these cases, no one cares about. The public is probably not really focused on what's happening in these institutions most of the time. And that returns to the question of who's getting the signal. Upsetting about whose markets are we shocking? Right, um, and, and what's the nature of your sample? Exactly. So, yeah. I have a, a slightly related question. So, I'm interested in what are the conditions that are driving cases into exit, um, which of course involves questions about what is the total population of these kinds of disputes that are out there, but to, to what extent are the the terms of arbitration, the terms of conflict arbitration, <coughs> just set ex ante in the contracts. It, before anybody knows what the nature of the dispute is going to be, to what extent does the contract say, you know, it's going to go to arbitration in such and such body, or it's going to go on into arbitration without, under conditions of transparency rather than secrecy, again, without anybody ex ante really knowing what these disputes are going to look like? Um, so the terms of the, I mean, hugely heterogeneous in terms of the natures of the investments, right? So the, the terms of arbitration always run through some treaty basis, but that treaty basis doesn't have to be exited. It could be a variety of other things. So there's rules for the United Nations that this process could be run through. And in terms of the, the nature of the specificity of each contractual <coughs> relationship that could potentially go to arbitration, I mean, we have no way in the of, of, of acquiring that information, certainly not for the population. Um, but not even for the population of the, those that are empirically observable. So my supposition would be hugely, hugely heterogeneous in terms of the specificity of the contract. But, but it's possible that um, secrecy versus non-secrecy or exit versus something else, it's predetermined before, that there is no causal relationship between the nature of the dispute and whether it's secret or not. Not, I mean, not, not through the exit process. So the, the, the few areas where it's predetermined, we went through the, the, the contract, the, the treaty-based contract, and we literally did contract analysis of every single one that was the basis for the dispute. And we identified provisions. So again, we keep the contract that's a bit, not the contract between the investor and the host government. Okay, but to, to roll through, we identified those cases where um, uh, disclosure was required, and we removed those from this analysis, but it's a very small number. It's growing, but it's a very small number. Um, so the answer is, is you know, it's actually genuinely the majority are not predetermined. Um, because what I can't speak to is the contract between the investor and the host government. Yes. That's not something that I can purely observe. Great. Are there any final questions? Well, let me take this opportunity to thank Emily Hatton for, for your great questions. questions.